Referred to as Britain's longest occupied fortified location, the site of Edinburgh Castle is also known as the most besieged place in Britain. A royal residence and military base, this castle transformed over time from a Bronze Age settlement to the birthplace of James VI and a prison during the American War of Independence. Hi, this is Veronica of History Victorum. Join us as we explore Edinburgh Castle and its history. The present-day castle sits atop an extinct volcano known as Castle Rock. It is an ideal defensible position with steep cliffs on three sides. The main entry to the castle is on the eastern side through the Royal Mile, which connects to Holyrood Palace at the other end. The site has been used for the last 3,000 years, with evidence dated back to between 972 and 830 BC. By 100 AD, an Iron Age fort was located here, which traded with the Romans who had entered the area during this time period from England. In the early medieval poem, The Gododin, this site is mentioned as Dean Aden, as a place where for a year warriors feasted prior to heading south to fight the Angles. They did not win this battle, and around 640 AD, Angles under King Oswald of Bernicia conquered the Gododin as well as Castle Rock. Edinburgh was given its anglicized name with the word Burra meaning fortress. Around 960 AD, the Angles lost their foothold in Edinburgh and Castle Rock. By 1093, a castle used by Scottish royalty was on Castle Rock and was referred to as the Castle of the Maidens. Many events have impacted the architecture of the castle over the centuries, such as English occupation, King Robert the Bruce's orders of destruction, the rough wooing of Mary Queen of Scots, the Lang Siege, Jacobite Risings, and rebuilding during the Victorian era have all led to the castle we see today. Reaching the top of the Royal Mile is this open area known as the Esplanade, leading to the castle's gatehouse. The Esplanade was built in 1753 as a parade ground by filling in the ground and buildings to achieve a flat, even surface and was later extended in 1845. It is used for the annual performances of the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo and musical events. In 2010, archaeologists found what is believed to be part of a military spur about 2 meters below the Esplanade. The spur was an outer defense of the castle that would have been on the lower part of the esplanade. The gatehouse we see here was built in 1888 during the Victorian era restoration and replaced one from the 1600s that was simpler. The gatehouse was built to provide an imposing feel and in 1929 two statues were added of King Robert the Bruce and Sir William Wallace to commemorate the 600th anniversary of the king's death. Archaeologists found in the area of the gatehouse two large ditches that were cut into the rock from the 1st century AD. When walking through the gatehouse, make sure to look up to each side of the walls. There are stone panels from the late 1500s, originally from the gun house, that feature Mons Meg and other munitions from the castle. The Half Moon Battery is a very impressive and unique site. It is one of five batteries in the castle, which are fortified areas for heavy guns. The Argyle Battery, built in the 1730s, Mills Mount Battery, the current home of the one o'clock gun, Four Wall Battery, built in the 1540s, and Dury's Battery. The Half Moon Battery was built following the Lang Siege, which ended in 1573, and was the final hope for an exiled Mary Queen of Scots to hold on to her kingdom. During the Lang Siege, many of the towers of the castle were destroyed, and the Half Moon Battery was built on the ruins of David's Tower which we will talk about later in this video. Its current state was a result of repairs following the 1689 siege by the English when, once again, the castle was held for a Stuart exiled royal, James II of England. You'll notice a wall coming down from the Half Moon Battery to a post. This, along with the post across the way, are the remains of the inner barrier. The inner barrier dates to the 1600s and included a pit along with a flying bridge, which was a structure where a soldier could stand and have an unobstructed view of the area. To the right was a gun platform, and around 1850 it was no longer needed. A roof was added to make this into a guardhouse and prison. It is now the gift shop and visitor information. Across the old gatehouse is a plaque highlighting Sir William Kirkcaldy of Grange's actions who was the commander during the Lang Siege. The Portcullis Gate, 
dates back to the 1570s with the upper story, known as the Argyle Tower, added in 1877, along with the Scottish Royal Arms. The gate had a total of four barriers made up of three wooden doors and an iron portcullis, which you can see here is held up inside the gate. During medieval times, the main route to the upper ward was the Lang Stairs. It was in the 1600s that the cobble road curving upwards was created to make it easier to move the heavy guns as they were taken in and out of the castle for battle. The cart shed building, now the Redcoat Cafe, was built in the 1600s and extended in 1746. In front of the building, archaeologists found artifacts of the first known settlement from the Bronze Age around 900 BC, and that leveling by filling in the rock could have started at this time. Passing through the Fugue's Gate, built by Charles II, we reach the oldest building in all of Edinburgh. St. Margaret's was built around 1130 by King David I in honor of his mother, Queen Margaret, and is still in use today. It is believed to be part of the first royal lodgings on this site that were built with stone. It is the only part of the castle that was not burned down by King Robert the Bruce, who captured the castle during the Wars of Scottish Independence in 1314. Thirty men using rope ladders climbed up Castle Rock and regained Edinburgh Castle. King Robert the Bruce then ordered that the castle be destroyed so that the English could not use the castle again, but he spared St. Margaret's Chapel. We also have an in-depth video on this building and St. Margaret, who was made a saint in 1250. In front of the chapel is Mons Meg, which was at the forefront of cutting-edge technology and a wedding gift in 1457 to James II. The gun was forged in 1449 at Mons in Flanders, now Belgium, and may be the largest gun fired in Britain. The kings of Scotland used Mons Meg at various battles, and eventually it was used ceremoniously, including celebrating Mary Queen of Scots' wedding. It was last fired in 1681 for the birthday for King James VI. It was eventually moved to the Tower of London in 1754, following the Jacobite Risings. It was in 1829 that Mons Meg returned to Edinburgh Castle. The four well, located by the four wall battery, is over 700 years old and was first mentioned in 1314 and was filled in upon King Robert the Bruce's orders to leave the castle in such a state that the English would find it unusable. In 1381, the well was cleaned and provided water to the castle once again. It was the main source of water at the castle, but was not sufficient to be the only source. This made it one of the supplies that was decisive in sieges, including the Lang Siege. It was recorded that on May 22, 1573, a large portion of David's tower fell. The four well was covered by rubble and the two-year siege came to an end in a matter of days. Most of the over two dozen recorded sieges on the castle were successful due to supply shortages, including water. A secondary well, known as St. Margaret's Well, was used to supplement the castle's water supply. The well house tower was built in 1362 around this well to defend it and is at the bottom of the castle rock between the northwestern end corner of the castle and the train tracks. You may notice that we took our pictures from a train. The water from this well had to be hoisted up using a large crane. Cisterns were also built near Fugue's Gate to hold rainwater. It is unclear when these two cisterns were built. In the 19th century, the small building next to the cisterns, now the Whiskey and Finest Food Shop, was built as a fire station for the castle. Right before reaching the entry to Crown Square, to the left, we find the remains of David's Tower. Rediscovered in 1912, David's Tower was built as a royal residence at Edinburgh Castle in the 1300s by King David II, son of King Robert the Bruce. It was over 100 feet high and represented his power. Eventually, James I had an extension added to another tower behind David's Tower that held the Great Chamber. The most infamous story tied to David's Tower is what is called the Black Dinner. In 1440, two young members of the Douglas clan, the 16-year-old 6th Earl of Douglas, and his younger brother were invited to dinner with the then 10-year-old King James II. The dinner ended with both boys being put to their deaths. As mentioned earlier, David's Tower fell during 10 days of continuous bombardment during the Lang Siege in 1573. The Half Moon Battery was built around and over the ruins of the tower. The lower stories of the tower are partially open to us today, 
and in Scotland it is the oldest royal lodging in existence. The Crown Square, previously known as the Palace Yard, was created in the late 1400s. Influenced by European courts, James III planned for a well-arranged set of royal buildings that included moving the royal residence from David's Tower to the Royal Palace. The Royal Palace began as a great chamber, which was the extension to David's Tower, and eventually was made from four different tower structures. On the first floor are the Honours of Scotland and Crown Jewels, with the entrance outside of Crown Square. The Honours of Scotland are the oldest crown jewels within the British Isles and are made up of the crown, sword of state, and scepter. All three together were first used in the coronation of Mary Queen of Scots. These were removed from Edinburgh Castle and moved to Dunodder to prevent them from being destroyed by the Parliamentary Army and Oliver Cromwell who captured the castle in 1650. They were later buried and hidden until the 18th century. The Honours of Scotland provided such a strong sense of the nation of Scotland that in 1745, a final Jacobite rising and siege of the castle took place when Prince Charles Edward Stuart, also known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, attempted to further strengthen the Stuart claim to the throne by capturing the Honours of Scotland that were located at the castle. The Jacobites were able to capture Edinburgh, but not the castle due to a lack of siege guns. You will also find here the Stone of Destiny, or Stone of Scone, which has been an important symbol during coronation ceremonies over the centuries for Pict and Scottish royals. In 1296, Edward I of England moved the stone to London, where it remained for 700 years until it was returned in 1996. The second floor entrance is in Crown Square and leads to the royal apartments. A presentation of Mary Queen of Scots' royal line is located in what was her bedchamber, with the birth chamber next door. This small room was where the future James VI was born on June 19, 1566, to Mary Queen of Scots. The room was renovated, including the addition of the Scottish coat of arms for his return in 1617 to celebrate his golden jubilee on the Scottish throne. Lake Hall and its antechamber are also located here and were restored for James VI's visit in 1617. Painting restoration also took place in the 1990s. These rooms would have been used to host the king and his entourage. Above the fireplace, which is from the late 1400s, is his coat of arms as the first king of Great Britain and Ireland. The Scottish unicorn and English lion were part of his coat of arms. James III began to turn the castle into a Renaissance palace and is believed to have started the building of this great hall, and his son, James IV, who married Margaret Tudor, completed it in 1512. The great hall sits partially on Castle Rock and partially on vaults built to provide support for the new building. The roof is one of the most important medieval roofs in Britain due to the timbers that came from Norway and the stone corbels. The stone corbels are the oldest in Britain with Renaissance symbols. The Great Hall was used for banquets even as James V moved the royal residence down to Holyrood Palace. Mary Queen of Scots held a banquet here upon her return to Scotland prior to her procession to Holyrood Palace. The building was eventually used as soldiers barracks and a military hospital. It was in 1886 that restoration efforts began on the Great Hall. The Queen Anne building was built following the Jacobite Rising of 1708 to house officers. The previous building was from the late 1300s and was of a single story with basements of two stories below. At one point, it was the Royal Gun House where Mons Bag was stored along with other artillery. In the 1500s, a kitchen was built using the south basements in order to feed guests in the Great Hall. The presence of war is found in the vaults underneath the Great Hall and the Queen Anne building. Over the years, these vaults had various uses including storage, kitchen, barracks, and prisons. It was first used for prisoners of war in 1758 during the Seven Years' War and held over 500 prisoners from that war. This was followed by the American War of Independence with most of the 1,000 prisoners being sailors and from different nationalities. This was also the case during the wars with revolutionary and Napoleonic France. Prisoners left graffiti carved on doors that referenced their names as well as the reasons they were there. You'll notice here there's an early version of the American flag. And here we have Lord North who was very much involved in the taxation of the American colonies. 
The northern side of Crown Square is the Scottish National War Memorial. The Church of St. Mary stood here and it was David II who had it reconstructed in 1366 to be the Royal Chapel. As Holyrood Palace became the royal residence, the building was converted in 1538 into storage for munitions. This building was demolished in 1754 to build barracks. It was in 1923 that the barracks were converted into a memorial for those who died in World War I. It was opened in 1927 and has memorialized soldiers from other conflicts. The stained glass windows have scenes of World War I. On the outside of the building, there are many decorations with specific meaning. With the castle having been restored and demilitarized, you will still find the new barracks and governor's house in the castle. The governor's house was built in 1742 and the new barracks were completed in 1799. The new barracks holds the Regimental Museum of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. In a separate building, behind the cafe, is the National War Museum, which was previously in the Queen Anne building when it opened in 1933. I really enjoyed visiting this site. My favorite parts to research were the Wells and St. Margaret's Chapel. What other sites would you like to see of Scotland? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for joining History Victorum.